Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another Sunday afternoon live broadcast interview. Um, one in a series where we try to inter where we do interview people we think have something very significant to say um, about building solidarity with the League of the People of Palestine. We've had a whole lot of um, excellent uh, guests before, but it's my great pleasure this week to introduce the author of the book you can see behind me, State of Terror, and several other works, Tom Suarez. Um, Tom, I think you're speaking to us from the UK, but wherever you are, a big welcome. Thank you for coming and joining us. Thank you, my pleasure. Yes, I'm in London. Great. Um, Tom, you're taking a lot of heat from the opposition. You're, most of the Zionist leaders in Scotland are Christian fundamentalists, and some of them send Christmas cards. But I don't think you're on their Christmas card list no. book. Um, it's a stunning book. I've read it. Um, most people who've read it um, are changed after they put it down. What's the basic theme of your book? Can you explain it, Tom? The basic theme to me is an attempt, uh, how can I put it, an attempt to take Zionism and x-ray it, see what, see what makes it tick. Because on the face of it, the, the hold that Zionism has on society in general, and certainly on our collective Western governments, doesn't make any sense. And it was my attempt to try to figure out what makes it tick. And you paint a picture of a movement saturated with terrorism, with a terrorist methodology from the very beginning, which along the way acquires the massive power of a state and then takes that terrorism to a whole new level or at least maintains it at a, at a blistering level against the Palestinian people. Have I read you correctly? I'm sorry, say that last again? Did I, did I read you correctly? Yes. The, okay, you, you, you have a land with a people and you want to replace the people on the land with a different people. Now, how do you do that without terrorism? By definition, you need two lines of terrorism. One, you need terrorism to force this land filled with civilians off the land. And then you need to force enough of the ethnically correct civilians onto the land. Neither of these can be done without, by definition, without violence against civilians for a political end. This is terrorism. There's no way around this. So you agree with Jabotinsky, the founder of revisionist Zionism, as against those people who... Can you hear me okay? Yes. So you agree with Jabotinsky against those people who kind of fudged it, that there's no alternative but massive application of violence uh, for a colonial project. And also agreeing with him, the fact that Zionism can only exist in a perpetual state of emergency. Zionism's great fear, its greatest fear, is a world in which Jews live in peace and inequality, at which point Zionism would become irrelevant. So Herzl's idea of uh, Jews, however they are to be defined, forming a people, a nation, uh, as French as the, as the French, or as, as, as naturally as the British or the English or the Lithuanians, you're right. saying that there's a design fault in the very concept of Zionist colonization. Of, of course there is. The uh, Zionism was the betrayal of the long struggle for equality. This was now what it did not want. It wanted the, the, the um, old anti-Semitic lie of Jews as a, this tribe that, that could not exist with other people. It wanted to make this the truth so that all people who it identified as Jews, and of course it did assign itself the, um, the, the exclusive right to define who was a Jew, that they by definition would only be able to exist amongst themselves in this new ghetto. Yeah, very few people actually who burn brightly on the issue of Palestine um, actually understand the radical departure that Herzl and his co-thinkers, you know, registered 
and the extent to which they were seen by the majority of Jews, rabbis and others, um, as anti-Semitic. You know, of course, some people know they were driven out of Munich towards Basel, but could you explain how that radical break, how radical that break was, Tom? The, the radical break being exactly what again? The Zionist notion that uh, Jews could not live among Gentiles in Europe and had to become fully European by colonizing somewhere outside Europe. In order to in order to convince enough Jews, now let's first of all let's state right up front that anti-Semitism in Europe and in Russia in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, it was horrific. And certainly one can sympathize with a uh, with a regular uh, non-political Jew who, if you told them, well, we have this new idea and we're going to go someplace where you'll be safe, you can live a normal life in, in dignity, of course, one can understand that this is this is very attractive. But by certainly by the time of Herzl's death and uh even more so by the time of the Balfour Declaration, when this was being discussed, the persecution of Jews had already become the means to establish a settler state. The settler state was not being established for the benefit of Jews, it was the other way around. And since Zionism was not able to convince enough Jews that this was the way to go, that that they had to, to forfeit their lives, give up on the struggle for equality, and move to this new ghetto. It could not do this by argument, so it did it by force. And its first step in doing that was to make itself the high priest of Jews and Judaism. And it would decide what a good Jew was. It would decide what Judaism meant. Now, obviously, it starts to apply violence against the Palestinian people when they set, when they finally settle upon Palestine. But in terms of relationships to other Jews, you say that it, it would be attractive to some Jews, of course, yes. uh, to go to a place in the sun, uh, etc. But it was very repulsive, it was very unattractive to many Jewish political movements. For example, the, the huge movement, it's so sad to see about a half a dozen members of the Jewish Bund get together in New York and that's all that's left. This movement was exterminated. But the Jewish Bund had nothing but contempt for Zionists. Said, Absolutely. We're German, we're Russian. We will unite to fight the anti-Semites. But as the Zionists said, we'll unite with the anti-Semites against the left. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, also, what I think is often forgotten is that, okay, let's say that Palestine was safe haven for persecuted Jews. And indeed, the Middle East in general was historically a place where Jews would go to get away from us, Europeans. Now, let's say that in principle, this was a reasonable idea. Okay, but Zionism was not immigration in the normal sense of the word. It wasn't going to live as equals and in peace with the indigenous people. No, they were usurpers to the land. They went at the expense of the of the indigenous people, and so when Zionism always talks about in, uh, during the uh, British Mandate period about increasing uh, Jewish immigration, immigration is really a euphemism. Tom, let's deal with something that will be a bit controversial. You hear endlessly in Palestine solidarity circles the argument that the Zionist mantra of a land without people, or a people without a land, was partly justified. That some, apparently, they concede the argument that Jews were a people like a nation without a land. Although many people, uh, many Jews disputed that. They said they were a religion and not a people. But let's concede that for the sake of argument. But they said the only problem was that Palestine was already occupied by a lot of Palestinians. Um, but Lenny Brenner, who will be coming to join us at some time in the future for an interview, he makes an interesting point. He says, look, leave aside Antarctica for the moment, which has got no people. But even if there were not a problem with the native Palestinians, Zionist nationalism was a kind of spin-off from Central European blood and soil nationalism. It was ugly, it was hideous, 
it was something repulsive as much as some of the worst Eastern European nationalisms today. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Tom? I agree with it. Zionism evolved during the late 19th century, during the period where racial nationalism was gaining ground. And Zionism seized on a, an all too real problem of uh, anti-Jewish persecution for its own brand of racial nationalism. And whereas during the 1940s, we fortunately put other forms of racial nationalism in, in their graves, Zionism was able to thrive by exploiting Jewish persecution. Yeah, um, I'm reminded of the Zionist uh, leader, one of the top three or four actually, Arthur Rupin. Um, he's my personal horrible favorite because he himself is a German romantic nationalist. He's in a dueling club. With the rise of anti-Semitism, they kick him out. He moves, his, he moves the ideology wholly over to Zionism. And he act, I mean, his, he's the father of settlement in the land of Israel, but he actually sees the ancient Jews, the ancient Hebrews rather, I should say, as Aryans. And I swear to God, alone an atheist, he actually says the ancient Jews, hewers of wood, uh, farmers, were corrupted by an infusion of Semitic genes, which they can only overcome. Oh, my God, it's, you have to lower your voice when you say this which can only be bred out of them by going to Palestine. I mean, this horrible nationalism is pretty repulsive, is it not? Absolutely. And the, uh, the whole, uh, slightly related to that, the whole argument as to uh, whether the Ashkenazi Jews were indigenous of Palestine, which of course they weren't, or whether you hear the argument about what a Semite is, but to me, all of this is a straw issue. All of this is irrelevant. There were people living there, end of story. Whatever you want to call them, there were people living there. And whether, the, whether you want to go back to biblical history, whether you want to go back to archeology span and show whose ancestors may or may not, by some blood connection or not, have had some relation to this land, it's all irrelevant. There were people living on the land, that's all that matters. I agree very much. You get some strange people in Palestine solidarity. who are very exactly. keen to talk about false Jews, false Ashkenazi Jews, da, da, da. Who cares? We're yes. dealing with living people. It does, I don't know where my ancestors were 200 years ago. And frankly, it's of no great interest. You're absolutely right. You violate human beings. You violate the rights of living people. That's the only thing that it comes down to, is it not? Tom, let me ask you now, um, when the Argentine football team cancelled their game in uh, Israel, uh, the relevant minister talked about uh, football terrorism had prevented Argentina from coming. Uh, we have um, Israelis talking of terror tunnels. Uh, we have terror kites flying in from Gaza. And, and terror balloons. <laughs> I believe, I believe for, his, for Israeli authorities, Palestinians have terror breakfasts and uh, terror hummus. Look, isn't the word, how do you use the word carefully? How can you avoid being completely subjective uh, in writing your book? What's your definition of terrorism? Never mind terror, which I don't quite understand. What's your definition of terrorism, Tom? It certainly is a problematic word, but I would broadly describe terrorism as violence against civilians to force a political goal. Makes it, perfect sense. Okay, if, if one accepts this definition, then the state of Israel is one of the greatest terrorist entities on the earth. And the actions of the Palestinians, and especially the Palestinians in Gaza, one may argue whether they are pragmatically wise. One can reasonably argue this, but they are immoral. No, they have every right to resist in whatever way they can. They have been denied any conventional means of defense, whether with weapons or diplomatically. This has all been ignored. And given that, 
whether one, let's take the Qassam rockets, the, the poster child of Gaza terrorism. Okay, now we can sit here and discuss whether this has made things better or worse, but no, we have no right to tell them that they cannot resist in whatever means is available to them. Tom, you've seen the fantastic film. Um, I forget the guy, the director's name again. Um, Battle of Algiers. Of course. Of course. Um, if anyone viewing hasn't seen it, you're very lucky because you can you still have that pleasure in front of you. But it shows the use of terrorism by the Algerian nationalist independent movement. So terrorism can be used either by people fighting for liberation or by or trying to impose domination. What's the distinction, though, between, if it's not totally subjective, a terrorist and a freedom fighter? Would you like to tackle that one? Uh, well, this puts me on the spot, but the distinction, it, this is a gray area, but the distinction that would come to my mind is that a freedom fighter would go to all lengths to avoid harm to innocent people, whereas a terrorist might be more indiscriminate. Do you mind if I challenge you on that, Tom? Sure. Because I, I respect your work greatly, and I think the greatest respect you can pay to somebody who writes like you do is to try and challenge. Um, I would think that the Algerian independence movement, even the Vietnamese independence movement, did inflict terrorism upon uh, civilians. Um, but I would think the argument, the distinction would be between those who are oppressed as objects of colonial domination and those who seek to impose colonial or some other form of domination as a political system. Could we live with that as a distinction between a freedom fighter, however critical we might be of them, and a terrorist? Does that make any sense to you? Yes, I suppose. Let's take Qassam rockets. If the people in Gaza had the ability to have a proper missile, which is to say that it's guided rather than a rocket, which is not guided. If they were able to target the IDF strongholds and they chose not to, but to target Starat instead, I would consider this wrong. I consider that no, that whatever means is, is available to them to target their violence against their actual oppressors. But can you be, Okay, I guess I'm asking. You, you know, that, come, come back to that wonderful film, um, Battle of Algiers. The, 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 the very articulate journalist is approached by the French Paris who say, hey, what are you doing? You're putting baskets full of bombs and cafes and so on. And he says, look, <laughs> if we don't have helicopters and F-16s. Give us the F-16s or the helicopters and we'll give up the baskets. Yeah. Um, so it's all, terrorism is the, is the response of the weaker party quite often in one way, but I guess my question is, before we move on, and I pick, pick you know, you utilize this, this, what you've written about, is um, can you be a terrorist and a freedom fighter at the same time? I would suggest yes. Uh, depending on one's, on how one nuances the words, sure. You, you know, uh, the Battle of Algiers was watched by the U.S. military. Yep. It's preparation for yes. the, the invasion of Iraq. Yeah, it's wonderful. If the, the the movie my my partner Nancy Eland th that movie is it's it's like a going joke between the two of us that when we're looking for something to do oh let's watch the the Battle of Algiers again absolutely stupendous warts and all um Tom um Iraqi Jews uh, a British a Scottish minister for external affairs met with a bunch of Zionists in Glasgow. And they, they jumped on him and they said, and he didn't, he wasn't briefed, he didn't know anything about it. He said, look, the Palestinians have been driven out. Uh, okay, a lot of bad things happened. That's really a pity. But look, even Stephen, a lot of Jews were also driven out of Arab countries uh, during that period. So let's move on. Those Jews have moved on. They're wonderful people. The Palestinians are a kind of pathetic bunch just languishing in refugee camps. How can people deal with that disgraceful argument? The argument, uh, of course, we've all heard this argument. This, uh, the argument itself, if forget even the circumstances, the argument itself is, is so horrifically racist. Mm. In other words, let's say 
somebody in France raped somebody in Peru. Oh, well, then somebody in Peru gets, gets the, the right to rape somebody in France. The argument is repulsive on the face of it. Yeah. And beyond the repulsiveness of the, of the argument, of course, the fact is that the, the, Iraq, the Jewish Iraqi community, which was the, one of the largest and oldest in the world, that was destroyed by the Zionists for the sake of Israel. So, okay. Um, Zion, I mean, what you describe in your book is, uh, a lot of it was new to me and I thought I knew a lot. Um, you, I think the first victim, the first assassination by Zionist squads was of uh, Jacob de Haan. 1924, so yes. Jacob de Haan, because I think he deserves to be commemorated every year, I think in June, yeah? Could you tell that story, Tom? Uh, he was a, a European Jew. He was a doctor. He moved to Russia. He became very intrigued by Zionism, moved to Palestine. Uh, once he saw what it was all about, he turned very much against Zionism. And yes, the Haganah assassinated him as he was leaving a, a temple. Um, and that was the, the first, as far as I know, the first recorded assassination of the Haganah, just what, four years after the establishment of the militia. And why did they kill him, Tom? Because he was not simply vocal against Zionism, he was active against Zionism, and they didn't like his influence. I believe I lost you for a couple of seconds there, Tom. Uh, can, can, you, can you add to that about? Yeah, I, I, I read, is it, is, I think it was in your book, but possibly elsewhere, but I've made a, a special interest in Jacob de Haan. Um, uh -huh. He was nominated by the chief rabbi of the native Jews of Palestine, uh -huh as their spokesperson, and he lobbied aggressively and uh, vigorously against the Balfour Declaration. Um, oh. And in his position, so it's not just that he himself is an anti-Zionist, ex-Zionist uh, opponent of, of Balfour, but he actually represents the native Jews of Palestine. And I think that's really why the Haganah gunned him down. Um, mm. And I think that story is so important to distinguish between Jews and Zionists, <laughs> between European colonizers and native Jews who had lived in relative harmony with yes. uh, their Palestinian uh, fellow citizens of the Ottomans for a very long time. And of course, er er early, er early on in Palestine, the dichotomy was not between uh, non-Jewish Palestinians and Jewish Palestinians. It was between the Zionists, settlers, and the Jewish and otherwise Palestinians. Of course, of course. And thus, Dahan had to be, had to be killed. Um, so the word, the word terrorism, you, you, describe such a, you describe such a litany um, of massacre. It's a story of massacre from before 48 to today with interludes as opposed to a story of occasional massacres. Um, how did you go about finding and amassing all this data, Tom? And uh, didn't you want to cut your wrists by the time you'd finished? There always seemed to me to be a, a, a gap in histories I would read. Okay, so we, we'd get to the Balfour Declaration, we get to the League of Nations and the British Mandate, and then there'd be some fudging going on until 1947 and resolution 181 and we reach the middle of 1948 and we have the Israeli so-called independence. We don't know independence from what, but what they call their independence. But there was something missing and I would come across odd references, for example, in some of the early um, UN communications or in some British communications that alluded to a far greater story of Zionist violence than at least I had been able to think about. And this all started, uh, one day there was a, uh, there was a bookseller friend of mine, an antiquarian bookseller, uh, he's, he's since passed away, but 
he contacted me one time. He says, look, I know you're interested in the Middle East. And I came across this pamphlet done by the British in Jerusalem in 1946. And it's simply uh, these diagrams and explanations about some of the Zionist uh, uh, terror bombs. And, and then he said, and I take this book very seriously because before the, the, the King David bombing, I had stayed in the hotel. So, so I picked this up from him and this really proved that there was something more going on. So I, I showed this to my, my friend Radha Karmi, who I'm sure you know. And I said, look, this is, a, this is very ephemeral. It's very interesting. It seems to be very uh, poorly known. Why don't I make a scan and put it online just to preserve it? But you had no, you had no idea what you were going to find. <laughs> well, she said, yes, this is a fabulous idea, but you can't just put the scan. You have to go and do a bit of research. So you have two paragraphs introduction. Okay, this sounded like a reasonable idea. So I started going to the British Library and I didn't find this to really answer the question. Then I started going to the National Archives in Kew. And several years later, it turned into that book. It very quickly, uh, it became ad addictive because it just, it was so jarring to what uh, I thought I had read a fair amount about the history, but it was so jarring mm -hmm. to me what was there, some of the material of which had been declassified for some time, but had been poorly gone through. Some of it had been very recently declassified. I was able to declassify a little bit. I failed to declassify some of it, but it, there was so much there that it did not change the story quantitatively. It changed the story qualitatively. Could you explain that? Because you thought, Terrorism would be a marginal phenomenon in the Zionist um, toolbox and Zionist methodology, but it wasn't. It was core. It was core, and it was targeting anybody who challenged the Zionist project, whether they were Jews, Palestinians, British. Jews were as much a victim as anybody else. In fact, most of the victims of Zionist assassination, that is a, a targeted individual rather than the victims of of mass bombings, most of the victims were Jewish. And the, the bottom line to me is, the, is this. It's that the way the United Nations, the way the Western powers behaved in 1947, in the uh, de facto, not explicit, but the implicit creation of, of the Israeli state, that was the direct capitulation to Zionist terrorism. It was the reason it happened. Tom, Margaret Thatcher even um, expelled the Mossad team from London yes. after a hit on a very prominent Palestinian. Could you, could you remind people of that? And then we'll talk about Israeli hits in other countries. You, you mean the cartoonist? Yes. Yes. Um, what's his name? If I remember, they were cl very clever, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, that they hired a Jordanian to, yes. so, so they could, even if, they, if it was tracked down, they could say, well, an Arab did it. So they were very clever about that. Thatcher didn't move against the Jordanian embassy, she moved against the Israelis and she expelled yes. the Mossad. She shut down the Mossad office in London following yeah. that. Well, I guess because, because, it, because it happened in the UK and she didn't like it happening here. That's right. That's right. They overstepped the limits. Um, from Norway, um, other European countries, uh, Israel seems to send murder squads uh, with relative impunity um, to various yeah. parts of the world. Can you comment on that, Tom? Why Israel has such sway over the Western powers is an intriguing question because, uh, okay, all, all countries, uh, many countries try to exert influence over other countries for their own benefit. This is nothing new and it's nothing exclusive to Israel. But the degree to which Israel is able to do this is, is baffling. Uh, but I, the only explanation I can give is that it has to do with Israel's success in entwining foreign countries' military involvements and uh, arms industry and security arrangements and business interests 
all so closely together that that it would disrupt all of them if they were to protest too much. What's your take on that? Well, that's a major discussion, and we discuss it from time to time, and it's well worth <laughs> devoting even a couple of hours to it. But I would have thought that uh, if you look at US aid to Israel, it's pretty modest until 67. And after 67, it goes through the roof. It just rises like this, and then it goes up. After Israel smashed Arab armies and uh, put paid to the idea for our generation that the people in that area should control its own resources. So I think that was worth, after the defeat in Vietnam, here was Israel offering the West a cop on the beat who could actually deal with almost any challenge. And especially after the Shah of Iran fell, the West had two feet in the, in the, in the Middle East. One fell, Israel was, they don't think the Saudis are going to survive very long or the Egyptian dictatorship. They can't do long-term planning with that lot. So right. I, a settler colonial project is a stability that uh, other dictatorships lie. Yeah. Even before, before 67, during the Eisenhower administration, even then, I, I find records where, where uh, the Eisenhower administration tries to hold back funds to Israel because of its actions, uh, for example, after Kibya but then in the end gives up because of the political pressure. Why that early is what I find difficult to, to explain. Israel hijacked US- Sorry, sorry to interrupt Tom, but he's still, he's still smart. I mean, we know about the liberty and lots of other amazing things, but he, he still smacked Israel very hard in 56, and he told Britain, France, and Israel to get the hell out of Egypt. And they- that was the only, But that was the only time when Eisenhower stood his ground after Sinai, that was the only time a U.S. president successfully stood up to it. But even before that, Eisenhower was tried to resist, and at the end, he was told he had a case. Okay, changes something a little bit, Tom. Um, Darin Tatur, just a poet, was jailed recently for a couple of years, or house arrest or jail, for terrorism or for supporting terrorism for a poem. Um, the... Uh, the definition of terrorism in the Israeli lexicon seems to cover everything. I mean, what can the Palestinians do which Israelis do not consider terrorism? I, I just don't know the answer. I th think that language is a crucial issue in, in everything we do, and certainly in anything contentious, but in this so-called conflict, talk about language, another problem, the very word conflict, but it, it, it has never been such a volatile issue as in, in this situation. And uh, not only the word terrorism, but look at the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, which is effectively running this country. Now. Everybody's running in fear of these, of these completely nonsensical words that are, that are contradictory, they're convoluted, and the, a definition that should comprise one sentence and that should per pertain to any kind of bigotry, whether it's against Jews or black people or gay people, whatever. It should be the same definition. You fill in the blank with the victim. But no, that we have this, this, this completely insane definition and that instead of pointing out on the face of it how bizarre it is, we're all running in fear of it. The, and, and if you then transpose this problem, yes, to the word terrorism in Palestine, where whatever it is, if, if, if it is in conflict with the Israeli state, it's labeled terrorism, and the word itself convicts the victim. You use the word, and you're automatically guilty. Well, you see everyone's running in fear, and certainly um, at an elite level, I'm, well, they may be run. I think certain elements are running in fear: the Labour Party, the SNP, politicos, and city councils, and so on. Certain people are whipping it up. They love it um, because Jeremy Corbyn's a threat not just to the Israelis but to everybody who wants to dismantle the health service and so on and so on. Um, well, I guess my question would be: um, How do you, how do you respond to the to, to to these kind of smears? 
Um, what, how sensitive do we have to be to vocabulary? Um, I mean, I think it's pr pretty simple. We, we sometimes carry a banner saying anti-Semitism is a crime, anti-Zionism is a duty, right? And the one is not the other. Um, what's the connection? With, what can we learn from McCarthyism? The, the, the wave of McCarthyism rose and rose and rose and became stronger, and then it broke. And then Charlie Chaplin could come back from Switzerland if he wanted, and various other people were rehabilitated. It simply broke and became discredited. What do you think is going to happen to this wave of current McCarthyism? My opinion, which uh, a lot, I've had a lot of pushback to my opinion, but my opinion remains this, is that we should stop defending ourselves against this smear. And instead of defending ourselves against it, we should turn it around and say, no, you, the, the Zionism, Zionism, the Board of Deputies, the so-called Campaign Against Anti-Semitism, these Zionist organi organizations and Zionism as an ideology, that is the anti-Semitism. You know, you mentioned, you mentioned Vietnam. Okay. Now, I was a teenager during the, the 60s or the height of the Vietnam War, and like a lot of uh, other people my age, I was very active in the movement against this war. Now, what was the reaction of the, of the government of the United States? Naturally, it accused us of being traitors. But what we were, what we were being accused of being traitors to, it was to this country, this, this national definition. We were accused of being unpatriotic or un-American. All right. But it stopped with this definition of citizenship. It had nothing to do with me organically. If I had been born of the same parents, but in a different country, I would have had a different uh, membership in, in, in this uh, national group. What, what Zionism has done is to get rid of these national borders and make ethnicity itself the frontier. So that it can claim, it can claim that Jews, simply because they are Jews, are part of this, of this national identity. And that therefore, if you criticize Israel, you are not merely criticizing the state, you are criticizing Jews as Jews. Now, okay, let's go back to Vietnam. If it was unpatriotic of me, un-American of me, to, to criticize the American government, then uh, to criticize its racist war of aggression, then implicitly, racist wars of aggression are American, are what America stands for, are what patriotic citizens support. Let's take the same analogy back to Israel now. So according to Israel, racist wars of aggression, which is what it's involved in, are, according to Israel, part of being Jewish. It is what it is organically part of Jews as Jews. What could possibly be more anti-Semitic than that? But this is the crux of Zionism. I think this has to be explained in very simple terms to turn the whole thing around and expose Zionism as the anti-Semitic racist movement that it is. I agree, and I'm not sure it's quite so difficult. Uh, this is one of my favourite images behind me here, Tom. It's the uh, one of the annual surveys conducted by the BBC World Service. Uh, but there's so many surveys, they all tell the same story. In terms of public opinion, Israel is already a polecat state. Um, it's a pariah state. They've lost the debate. There's no question about it. Israel never gets out to the bottom Four, and sometimes it's the very bottom of the most unpopular country in the world. Survey after survey after survey. I'm, I'm sure, you, do you know that some years ago the EU ran an opinion poll about attitudes to foreign countries? They gave 25,000 people a list of countries, which country is the greatest threat to world peace? Um, Israel came top in every country in Europe. 59% chose. So, in terms of public discourse, like in Germany, it's closed down quite substantially, even compared to here. But in terms of what people actually think, Israel's on a loser if we stand our ground and, and, uh, and fight back. Let me ask you a couple of questions about terrorism. Um, a lot of people, Israel thinks they can close down a debate by shouting the word Hamas. Um, 
But you know, in every settler colonial project, the anti-colonial people are demonized. They are savage, their violence is unreasonable. Um, who was the famous conquistador who said uh, of the Caribbeans, we call them cannibals because they defend their homes very stoutly. I forget the guy's name, but he, he was onto something, yeah? They're cannibals because they fight back against the Spaniards. And Hamas are savages because they fight back against the Zionists. What should our attitude be to Palestinian resistance? Um, as you say, I think it can be terroristic, like setting off bombs and, and, and blowing up civilians. Um, but what should be our attitude to the vexed question of supporting Palestinian resistance? So, for example, the Scottish Green Party has an excellent policy. They support Israel as a settler colonial state. They support BDS and they support Palestinian resistance. They specify non-violent resistance. I understand that, right? What should our attitude be to, as the author of State of Terror, to those people who resist Zionist terrorism in ways that you and I might not recommend? This past year, this past year, we have seen the most brilliant non-violent attempt by Palestinians to bring world attention to what they're being put through, the Great March of Return. Now, if you break it down to, to its bare bones, it is nothing more than people wanting to go home, just like you or I might go home every day, because their homes are over the on the other side of the so-called border, on the other side of the armistice line. Those are their rightful legal homes. All they want to do is go home, and they're being shot dead for the attempt. There's nothing more complicated. Everything that Israel puts in the way to explain, well, this and that, and they're breaching the border, and this and that. No, these are all artificial, artificial arguments introduced to completely obscure the issue that they are only trying to go to their own rightful homes. So the idea that the Palestinians should embark on on a peaceful resistance, no. They were, were, they were resisting peacefully all through the, the, um, the mandate period. There were two periods of um, Palestinian uprising, the late 20s, the late 30s, then from the, the Second World War on until late 1947, there was virtually no Palestinian resistance. They tried to go the peaceful diplomatic route and obviously you see what's happened to them. Now, you fast forward to today and okay, so we have terror attacks, we have Qassam rockets and everybody says, why can't they engage in peaceful resistance? We now know what happens to them when they engage in peaceful resistance. Who is supporting this? It's your country and my native country, the United States. We are the ones responsible for this. It's our moral responsibility to stop our governments from doing this. That's what we need to do. You know, I was uh, shortly after Castlet, I was in Gaza. I was with a handful of Americans. We managed to get in through Rafa, which even at that time was very difficult. We got in and we simply wanted to bear witness as to what was going on. So in the North- What year was this, Tom? It was early 2009, just after Castlet. Okay. In the North of Gaza, we were, walking through the scene of, of complete devastation. And there were this remains of a house. And there was an old man that came out from the, the, the rubble and he was holding a live landmine. One, one of the mines that the Israelis had used to destroy his family's house, but this one had failed to explode. So he comes out and he sees us. And fortunately we had an interpreter and he starts screaming at us holding this live mind. So what he was saying was that, don't come here and pity us. I don't want you to come here and look at me. I want you to go back to your country and stop your country from doing this to me. And of course, he was right. How can you gainsay that? Yeah. No, we don't want people to simply bear witness. We don't want people simply to emote. We want to build the BDS campaign and look for Israel's vulnerabilities. Tom, you quite rightly said Israel's a species of settler colonialism. Um, the main authorities in that academic field of study talk about a built-in tendency to genocide. 
that may or may not be realised. But the main thing is to eliminate the native, and that could include, in certain situations, genocide, mass killing. Have we reached that stage already? I think there's an argument for that. The esteemed Richard Fault, a couple of weeks ago or last week, I posed a question to Richard Fault and asked him if he would apply the word genocide to what's happening in Gaza now. He said, still backing off from, from using it on technical grounds, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's applicable. Any question like that, one first has to define how you're using the word. And once you define the word, then you can answer the question. But uh, obviously, genocide, the word to most people means a mass murder of, of people because of their ethnicity and a complete annihilation of, of that ethnicity. That's what most people think of. Now, is that happening? Obviously, that is not happening. But are Palestinians being murdered because they're Palestinians? Yes, absolutely. And if you apply the word uh, genocide to mean the attempt to erase a civilization, yes, it is absolutely that, both by erasing and by lifting, by trying to steal that civilization, the identity of that civilization for yourself. And if you include the lives of misery that have been created by this movement, all the, the millions of people who live destitute in refugee camps, in Palestine and in the surrounding countries, every day, day after day, for years, for decades, because of the Zionist movement. Yes, I would call it genocide. I, I think it's debatable, but I thought that the killing of hundreds is, of course, less than the killing, the slaughters of 2014, 20, 2009. But there's something new, I think, in the deliberate naming uh, crippling for life of thousands, actually well over 10,000 Palestinians over the last year since March. Um, and I would have thought that numerically that the killing, but even more so the actual shattering of limbs and the deliberate maiming, not killing, but maiming, yes. uh, fits Lemkin. You know, Lemkin, the, 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 the main survivor of the Holocaust who, who developed the law, the legal framework for genocide. He defines genocide as the deliberate harming of a people or a section of a people because of who they are. Yes. So I would have thought that. Tom, what can I say? Your book's great. Um, we've got a whole bunch of copies. We got them uh, for a deal from the publisher. Order your copy. You shouldn't be without one. It's a, a, it's a coherent narrative and analysis, but it's absolutely full of uh, invaluable data. Tom, do you want to make any concluding remarks? We want to build effective solidarity with the people of Palestine. We think that means agitation and education. Um, we're in debt for you writing this book, but what would you like to say to people in your closing remarks, Tom? To me, the most important thing in the UK and certainly in the United States is to liberate Jewish identity from Zionism. Jewish identity is being held hostage by Zionism, and that is why it is so difficult to fight against this injustice. And we need to stop playing along with this idea that the Board of Deputies, that the campaign against anti-Semitism, that all these, and the Israeli state, that they own Jews. No, they don't. They, have, they are using Jews as a human shield to empower new racial crimes. And this is only exacerbated by the, uh, the fact that the IHRA definition itself invokes the name of the Holocaust. This is obscene, and this has to be exposed for what it is. If, Please. if, if the, the Burmese, all governments have propagandists in other countries trying to serve their, their needs. Let's say that the Burmese government, another country uh, guilty of, of ethnic cleansing, let's say the Burmese government's propagandists were to go to 10 Downing Street and say, okay, we have a new definition of anti-Buddhist bigotry. The new definition is that we own Buddhists, and if you criticize our ethnic cleansing and repression of the Rohingya, that is anti-Buddhist hate speech. 
well, you know, this would be laughable. This would be ridiculous. Yet this is precisely what Zionism and Israel have done. And we run away from it in fear. No, we have to stop, turn around and confront it. Couldn't agree more. We have a lot of people of Pakistani origin here in the UK. Um, they don't feel hurt and upset if I were to argue as I do. That I think Pakistan in 1948 was a bad idea. I wish the Muslims had stayed in a greater India. Uh, the Hindu chauvinists today would have a harder time. Um, but the state that was set up the same year, apparently now, to say it was a bad idea um, is racist and is uh, demeaning to a community, a British community. It's preposterous, Tom. I totally agree with you. Totally agree. Look, thanks for coming on. Um, Thank you so much. My pleasure. We'll build on what you said. We need to go on the attack. Next week, I hope to have Lenny Brenner was supposed to speak this week, but we've lost contact with Lenny. Um, his brilliant book, Zionism in the Age of the Dictators, I think Tom would recommend wholeheartedly as well. Absolutely. That's a, a real classic, yes. Yeah, absolutely yes. marvelous. Um, so I hope to get uh, Lenny next week. And that right. is to argue how preposterous is it to say that we who resist a racist state are the racist. Zionism is racist from its very core, in its nature, in its, uh, in its attitude towards Jews, in its attitude towards Gentiles. It's a racist ideology that buys into the worst uh, aspects of Central European nationalism. Tom, I don't know if I can share this with you. I'm, I'm, I hesitate to tell you anything in the, in the subject, but I was really interested in Arthur Rupin. Tom Segev has written a short piece in Haaretz a few years ago which is just one article. It's about uh, uh, Rupin, and it made me absolutely amazed. Not only is Rupin, not only did he learn from neo-Nazi ideology and racism, his thinking fed back into it. And by the way, uh, and feel free to quote this, anybody watching, Tom Segev, article in Haaretz about Arthur Rupin, um, Arthur Rupin is also the father of uh, Israeli sociology. He did a lot of work on Jewish noses. He actually measured Jewish noses and he concluded that European Jewish noses proved that they were superior to the lesser Jews from the Oriental countries. You couldn't make it up. And there's more. I swear to God. Maybe she's listening. Maybe she's not. I swear. That article... You read that, you internalize that, you can face any Zionist who accuses us of racism and you can drive them from, from the field. So, Tom Juarez, I'm really grateful that you came on. And Tom has not only written um, uh, State of Terror, he was kind enough to give us uh, some time back. We've still got a few copies of an earlier work by Tom, uh, of photojournalism, um, fo wonderful photographs and commentary on Palestine, Jerusalem especially, uh, a decade ago. So, Tom Suarez, a great pleasure, an honour to have you. Keep up the good work. The Zionists hate you. You're a nasty anti-Semite, and uh, you join the Scottish Trade Union Congress, the Church of Scotland. I think you're joining the great bulk of you. <laughs> Thanks again, Tom Suarez. Thank pleasure. you so much, Mick. Bye-bye. Okay, those who are still listening, two items of news. Um, I just spoke to a guy this morning who was at a, a meeting um, in central England. A young, not, sorry, not a young, a woman um, went on behalf of her church to Palestine, came back and wanted to write about it in her church journal, magazine, and uh, the IHRA definition is being used against her testimony. Um, and she was threatened with it if she went ahead and discussed what she had seen in Palestine on a church delegation. Things are as bad as that. Um, much more high profile, of course, is Chris Williamson. Chris Williamson has never made an anti-Semitic statement in his life. His words, which even as distorted are not anti-Semitic, his words that the Labour Party has not fought hard enough against these malitically, <laughs> malitically, pol malicious and politically driven uh, accusations of anti-Semitism is absolutely true. And now he has once again, for the second time, been suspended from the British Labour Party. 
many other people have been threatened. Um, so it's a campaign of fear. But look, they're not threatening to pull out fingernails. They're not threatening to take people around the back of the, the whatever and shoot them. It's about being suspended from one bloody political party. Stand up and fight. And even if you leave the Labour Party, there's life outside it. There are other parties you can join. Uh, the Labour Party has a lot of good people in it, wonderful people, but it's got a lot of monsters as well. Tony Blair, Tom Watson, shake hands and count your fingers. People who are totally in favour of massacring brown-skinned people. Um, people who remember that Jeremy Corbyn said that Tony Blair may have to face up to the consequences of his action, i.e. a court, uh, a legal process, for lying and uh, you know helping to get uh, the invasion of Iraq underway. In 1945, the, the Nuremberg trials concluded that aggressive war, invading another country without good reason, was the highest level of human criminality. And Tony Blair and many of the Labour Party are guilty of that. So of course they're fighting for their political lives. They'll smear and lie and cheat. Even when caught, they'll continue to smear and lie and cheat. They have no shame. But look, they're attacking. Tom's right. We should stand our ground. Zionism is racism to a very profound degree. Um, and uh, we have to stand up, my concluding remarks, we have to stand up for the resistance of the people of Palestine. My mother told me a long time ago when I went to school, you cannot stand up to bullies who bully others if you can't stand up for yourself in the school playground. It's absolutely profound. We can't stand up for the people of Palestine unless we can stand up for our own rights to free expression, free discussion, and the condemnation of racism, mass murder, and I would argue genocide. So this is the time we're alive. We don't have any choice except but to capitulate, and that's no choice at all. We will fight. We will win if we're strong enough. Thank you very much for listening. Please like the Scottish Palestine Solidarity Campaign Facebook page. It really helps us. Please share this video. Please add your comments, critical, positive, critical and positive. Um, and please ask people to share the ideas of Tom Suarez, last week's dis uh, discussion with Richard Falk, uh, next week's, I hope, with Lenny Brenner, and so many other excellent people we've had here um, who've added something special to the conversation about Palestine. Thanks again. Thanks for joining us. Bye.